So um, we're going to get started. Uh, thank you all for coming today. So in the back of the room, we have books um, for sale. We have its books for sale. So uh, if you buy a book and hang around later, you can get it signed by the author. So please, um, you know, hang around and do that if you'd like. And so welcome. Good afternoon, and thank you all for coming. So my name is Tahira Akbar Williams. I'm the librarian for African American Studies and the College of Education. I'd like to thank you and welcome you to, to welcome everyone to the first event in the 2018 calendar of library events, um, we, the Speaking Book Series. So this series was started by libraries in 2005 to showcase some of the excellent research being published by faculty right here on campus. To, today, we will hear from a presentation from Dr. Campbell F. Scribner, and his book is titled, The Fight for Local Control, Schools, Suburbs, and American Democracy. Before we do that, I just want to mention a couple of events, upcoming Speaking of Books events. First, uh, Carol Graham, Happiness for All, Unequal Hopes in the Lives and Pursuit of the American Dream. That's going to be on February 27th at 4.30. Valerie Orlando, The Algerian New Novel, The Poetics of a Modern Nation, 1950 to 1979. That's going to be on March 8th at 3.30. Sarah Hamish, Arab Women's Activism and Sociopolitical Transformation, Unfinished Gender Revolution, and that's going to be in April 5th at 4 p.m. All those events will take place here in the special events room, um, 6137. So, however, today we are here to hear from Dr. Campbell F. Scribner. He's going to discuss the book, The Fight for Local Control, Schools, Suburbs, and the American Democracy. He writes, many of our life's opportunities are determined by where we attend school, with profound racial and economic inequalities inscribed between districts. Attempts to remedy these differences have repeatedly failed in court despite clear legal mandates. In the fight for local control, he explains why educational inequalities persist, outlining a dilemma between social justice and democratic participation. Dr. Scribner is an assistant professor in the College of Education where he teaches courses in educational policy, the history of education, and the philosophy of education. He holds a doctorate in education policy and American history from the University of Wisconsin. In addition, the fight for local control, in addition to the fight for local control, he has published articles in the American Journal of Education and the History of Education Quarterly. He is currently working on two book projects, a co-authored volume on the history and philosophy of school punishment and an overview of property destruction in American schools since the colonial era. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Campbell F. Scribner. Coming. Uh, it's a nice day outside. You've chosen to be here. So it's very kind of you. Um, I'd like to open up with a problem that's probably very familiar to you uh, in your own lived experience. Uh, these are maps, and I could have picked maps from any city in the country, frankly. Uh, and they show school district boundaries or within districts attendance zone boundaries. And they show racial segregation within and between districts, with the darker areas representing students of color who, as you'll notice, in many cities are packed into some areas and almost excluded from other areas. Um, given that we are now more than 50 years after Brown versus Board of Education, when we ostensibly desegregated American schools, the continued racial segregation of American schools should probably trouble us. And so what we're going to be talking about today is why this has happened, uh, whether schools actually ever did desegregate, and if they did, why they have started to resegregate along, along racial lines. I'd actually like to back up to the beginning of the 20th century, long before the Brown decision, to sort of set the, the framework for how we think about this issue. Um, America's most famous philosopher, and a very, uh, especially a philosopher of education named John Dewey, once wrote that democracy is a way of life, controlled by a working faith in the possibilities of human nature. This faith may be enacted in statutes, 
but it's only on paper unless it is put in force in the attitudes which human beings display to one another in all the incidents and relations of daily life. This notion that democracy is not merely about voting, it's not merely about elected office, but actually about how we interact with each other in society in all different ways is very powerful. Unfortunately, it raises another very thorny problem that Dewey was aware of. It puts a certain dilemma in the notion of what democracy actually is or what it actually needs to function. On the one hand, Dewey would argue that democracy requires community. And on the other hand, he would argue that it requires equality or equity. Both of these are necessary to function in a, in a good democracy, and yet at times, these two virtues can actually be at loggerheads and in direct contradiction with each other. So when we talk about community in schools or in American life, we have some notion of face-to-face -face relationships, an intimacy, a sort of acknowledgement of other people, of other citizens. There's a notion that we share a common good or a common culture in our community, however big or small we might define it. There's a notion of political participation and self-government. You actually have to show up, run for office, vote, be there at meetings. That's part of what's in, uh, sort of inscribed in the notion of community. And lastly, there's a, a quintessentially American dedication to local initiative, maybe even private initiative. We've often been described as a nation of joiners. If you go all the way back to Tocqueville, there's this celebration of the energy in local communities in America, which Tocqueville at least sees as the quintessence of democracy. On the other hand, democracy also requires equity, which means opportunities for self-realization. You should be able to become all that you can be. You should be able to live up to your potential. Some assumption of an equal distribution of resources. Obviously, great wealth and great poverty do not usually exist in a functioning democracy. We need some sense of commonality with, with our uh, resources, but the resources behind us. Likewise, we need a mitigation of unearned advantage. Um, several of my undergraduates are here, and right now we're reading Plato's Republic. The whole point of that book is that it shouldn't matter who your parents are. In a good society, your own virtues, your own talents should determine how far you rise or fall. Clearly, that's one of the, the essences of, of, of the American creed, but it's often not actually honored. Lastly, today we're going to be talking a lot about liberals, 20th century, 20th century liberals, and how they want to achieve equity. Almost all of them would say that you achieve equity through some kind of top-down government regulation. If you leave people to themselves, they will be bad to each other, they'll discriminate, they'll do all kinds of unsavory things. Uh, so clearly, we need to have government regulating and stopping and remedying these injustices. So Dewey himself had somewhat of a plan for trying to reconcile equity and community. Um, at the University of Chicago, he actually created a laboratory school where he was going to experiment with different ways of teaching and learning, but also with different ways of being, different ways of living. And so the students famously did not just sit in desks like most students do, but they did projects. They built houses. They sheared sheep. They were sort of all over the place. It was one of the, the sort of founding pillars of what we would call progressive education. Dewey would argue that ultimately, in order to really understand each other and achieve the intimacy of community, we need to know how we're actually interrelated. And so oftentimes, students would do things like spin wool. They would want to know how to make clothing. And eventually, they would want to know where their own clothes came from, who's making them. And for Dewey, that sort of following of our human connections, where's our food from, where are our clothes from, how, does, how do labor relations work, he thinks that that's going to foster a certain degree of human recognition. It's hard to live with sweatshops when you realize that you're wearing the product of another human being who's working in those sweatshops. And so for Dewey, a small community could actually sort of expand outward into a bigger community, and in the process could also focus people's minds on equity and on social change. It's not a, a sort of an accident that at this very time, he's in one of the biggest cities in the country. It's quickly industrializing, urbanizing. It's a huge place with crime and sanitation problems. And yet he has students doing things that we would see as very old fashioned. Again, they're spinning wool. They're, they're using their hands to make wood and metal. Um, for Dewey, he's trying to basically break down distinctions between the past and the present and trying to reclaim a sort of lost vision of American community that he sees existing in small towns, and especially in one-room schoolhouses. Again, these sort of scenes are not that different from what you might see elsewhere at exactly the same time. Up through the 1920s, most Americans attended school in very small buildings in the countryside with a single teacher and a mixed age of students. Um, we'll talk about the shortcomings of these schools in a moment, but for right now, I'll just point out 
in these schools, you have students learning at their own pace. There's no real set curriculum because there's not enough kids for it. You have students helping each other. There's cooperative learning. Um, at times, you can even have sort of inquiry-based learning. Again, a lot of the things that I think now progressive educators are very interested in. You also, if you're interested in community democratic participation, one of schools are community centers. Uh, parents help build them often. They're entirely funded locally. The parents hire the teachers. The parents serve on the school board. It's very, very clear what's happening in the school because the teacher often will be living with families. And so there's direct community buy-in. Again, in a way that Dewey finds very attractive. Um, I should point out, though, that there are shortcomings. And the kid here with bare feet in the front might remind us that rural poverty should sort of be on our minds. Um, one room schools obviously were not big enough and did not have the funding to hire well-prepared teachers, often. Uh, and with one room, you're not going to have many of the amenities that you would associate with upper, the higher reaches of learning, right? There are no chemistry labs, there's no cafeteria, there's no school nurse, there's no nothing. It's very basic learning. Because of that, lots of educational reformers at the, in the 1920s, just as Dewey's writing, kind of ignore or actually write off the benefits of community that are inscribed in one-room schools and instead hit much harder on the equity issue. And they do not see one-room schools answering that problem. They think these students are not going to even be equipped to go to high school, much less college. They worry that they're not going to be equipped to operate in a modern economy without shop class or home economics or anything else. And so they see one-room schools as a real problem with the quality of education. And as a result, there is a steady campaign to close them. So starting in the 1920s, continuing all the way after World War II, really up until the mid-1960s, you have state departments of education, state legislatures, teachers unions, and other groups forcibly closing one-room schools and consolidating rural districts into larger regional districts. All of this is for the, with the idea that you're going to create more equitable uh, institutions that can uh, provide a higher level of learning. So this is called Halfway Prairie School. It's in Mesa Manny, Wisconsin, just west of Madison. You'll notice it operated from statehood. Wisconsin became a state in 1848 until 1962, which was, I think, much later than most people might realize. When this building was forcibly closed by the state of Wisconsin, students went right down the road to Wisconsin Heights High School. And you'll notice Wisconsin Heights is in Mesa Maney, but it's not called Mesa Maney High School. That's because in an effort to sort of mollify all the rural districts around it, they had to give it a very generic name so that they didn't feel like they were losing their particular identity sending their kids to Mesa Maney. So this school still stands. Uh, this is what students are still, uh, where they're still learning in, in rural Wisconsin. And I presume this looks much like the buildings where most of us went. Large cinder block brick buildings um, where probably, unless you happen to live close to the school, you were bust there. Um, and you reaped all the benefits of that. And again, there are many benefits to it. On the one hand, you have wider tax bases. It's not merely the local neighborhood funding the school. That leads inevitably to more equitable funding and higher levels of funding. You get a more professional faculty, people who have four-year degrees, teaching credentials, maybe even master's degrees in their field. That was not guaranteed in one-room schools. And again, you have better facilities, gyms, cafeterias, etc. So by the 1950s and 60s, with the rise of suburbs and the rise of consolidated districts in rural areas, you start to get what we would see as a modern education system all of a sudden, while also losing a lot of the sort of community-based education that had existed for at least a century before that. So this is a map of school districts now in America, and it looks like there are an awful lot. There are 20,000. But again, this is only a tenth of the number there would have been at the turn of the 20th century when there were over 200,000. And the reason I'm showing this map is to actually show you a regional discrepancy. If you, had to add, if you had to guess where consolidation happens the earliest and the most completely, where are the districts the biggest? Right, Nevada, et cetera. But bear in mind that those places also are very recently states. As early as the 1880s and 90s, it's actually the South, including Maryland, where you get county-based districts rather than town-based districts. And the question is, why do you get county-based districts in the South earliest and eventually in the West as well? Um, it wasn't initially for reasons of equity, I'll just tell you that. Uh, in the South, county-based districts are more uh, sort of acceptable, partly because before the Civil War, the South did not have public education. And so they didn't have commitments to these little schools in their neighborhoods in the same way that people in the North might have. After the Civil War, the South does get public education, but also, of course, has segregated schools. And there's the threat that if you have little town-based schools, you might not have enough black kids and enough white kids to separate them. You might not have enough money to run two different school systems 
even if you profoundly underfund one of them. And so basically countywide districts provided the numbers of students and the amount of resources to provide for segregated schools. Eventually it's also going to at least offer the potential for equity, but in the short run know that it's not actually all that equitable. To the degree that one-room schools do persist in the South, they're almost entirely <coughs> devoted to black students. So again, up through the 1950s and 60s, if you go to rural Mississippi, rural Alabama, it's not uncommon to find tar paper shacks that hold 50 or 60 <coughs> students who are obviously not getting the same education as their white peers down the road might be getting. Which brings us to the Brown case. Um, if you don't know the basics of, the, of the, the sort of origins of the Brown decision, little Linda Brown, who is cute as a button, she's about 11 years old here, um, she and her younger sister, uh, their father is a welder and a minister in Topeka, Kansas. They actually have to walk by their neighborhood school, which is a white school. They have to walk through a freight yard, get on a bus, kind of get bussed all over creation to go to a segregated elementary school across town. And so when the case is launched, you'll notice that it actually sort of conflates in ways that I've been trying to separate community and equity. Clearly, Brown versus Board of Education is trying to attack the equity problem. It's trying to attack racial segregation. But it's also saying that Linda Brown wants the right to go to her community school, not to have to bus far away, but to just be able to walk to her community school. And so knowing that these two things could be in tension eventually, I'll just for the moment rhetorically ask, which one do you think the case is really about? Is Brown about access to community schools for everybody? Or is it ultimately about achieving equity, even though that might mean not going to your community school? Because very quickly after, after the decision, this choice becomes evident, and you'll see which way it goes. Um, after the Brown decision, of course, you get sort of vile representations of racism in the South, student strikes, bomb, schools are bombed, I mean, all sorts of things happen. And you get a lot of the very inflammatory language of massive resistance. So we won't go to school with Negroes, we're going to strike, we're going to shut the whole system down, which does happen in many areas of the South. Um, I'll mention that even in the South, this kind of overt racism doesn't actually play well for lots of people. Even white people, middle class white people in the suburbs, for instance, don't actually want to shut down public education merely because there might be some form of desegregation. They're willing to make compromises. It's usually in rural areas and small towns, for reasons I've already mentioned, that you get the strongest kickback to the Brown decision. And eventually that is going to fade for a variety of reasons. Um, and we'll sort of see what happens with that. Uh, turning our attention north, I'll just mention that in the north, you don't have the state uh, creating unequal educational spaces in the way that you do in the south, or at least not as obviously. What you do have is the state creating community in ways that is also discriminatory. So when I open up by saying that community and equity are somehow innately opposed, I'll point out that in this case, community isn't like organically bubbling up. It's not actually people making their own decisions about where to live exactly. It's state-created community, which I think adds an interesting wrinkle to this. In this case, you have the state acting through multiple different avenues to create segregated communities. Um, if you're familiar with redlining, uh, Starting in the progressive era, you have zoning decisions and mortgage lending decisions. Basically, realty, realty associations want to make sure that home buyers and their own clients have safe investments in their homes. And so they will refuse to sell to uh, minorities in all white neighborhoods, for instance. You get restrictive housing covenants, which will uh, prohibit home buyers from selling to a minority group, Jews, African Americans, whoever. Um, and this obviously helps maintain white. Uh, well, lily white suburbs for the most part. Also, you get insurance maps where the federal government through its uh, mortgage insurance programs, the Veterans Administration, etc., actually prohibits itself from lending to homeowners in certain undesirable areas. Those areas are either places where you have high concentrations of minorities living or even where you have mixed populations and it was seen as too risky of an investment. And so when you see the rise of slums and ghettos, this is sort of the language of the 1950s and 60s, it's not like a natural thing. It's basically because some people can't get home loans and some people have to get shoved into you know, tenement apartments and other places and can't actually keep their neighborhoods up in the ways that other more affluent people can. So through a variety of state mechanisms, in the North you don't have school segregation, but you do because you have neighborhood schools that are rooted in all white or largely black communities. School districts themselves, although legally they don't say that they're segregated, they also engage in lots of shenanigans to make sure that schools remain segregated in northern cities. 
Those include placing schools right in the middle of racially homogenous neighborhoods rather than on borders between neighborhoods. Or should a neighborhood start to shift, they would just redraw attendance zones to make sure that some kids would still get bused back to an all black school or an all white school, depending. Notably, when all of those various kinds of subterfuge don't work, they actually will even bus white students across district lines to attend a different school if the school has become, has too high of a percentage of black or Hispanic students. Um, that's an important point to keep in mind when we get to busing in just a moment. So note that generally in the South and in the North, there was a firm commitment to racially segregated schools. It was accomplished different ways, but it was there and operated in both cases. In 1971, after over a decade of failed desegregation attempts, the Supreme Court has been steadily sort of tightening the screws on the South, trying to actually get them to achieve racial desegregation in their schools. By 1971, uh, they recognized that, in fact, there might not be a firm distinction between de jure segregation, which is segregation by law, a white school and a black school, and what's called de facto segregation, which at the time meant, oh, well, people just live with who they want to live with, and if they happen to live with people like them, that's not the state's responsibility. Obviously, by 1971, the Supreme Court has looked at the history of redlining, attendance zones, and other things, and say, no, actually, it is kind of the state's responsibility. They have created these racially homogenous schools. The state needs to take affirmative steps to uncreate them and actually achieve racial balance in the schools. The case that sets the tone for this is out of Charlotte, North Carolina. And I'll remind you that North Carolina, like Maryland, has countywide districts. So Charlotte and its suburbs are all in Mecklenburg County. It's all one district. And so basically that district falls under a desegregation order where the Supreme Court orders it to bus students around the district from the suburbs to the city and vice versa in order to achieve racial balance. Um, interestingly, in this decision, when, when they anticipate that people might object to busing their students, the Supreme Court actually says, look at rural areas. They bust their students for 50 years. They've never had a problem with it, which actually ignores one that it hadn't been that long ago that rural areas had to bus their students, and there was huge resistance to it in rural areas, which they also sort of overlooked. <coughs> um, after the Swan decision, you get lots of other cities, Boston, Columbus, and elsewhere, who also try to implement busing programs. In this case, you run into problems, and I want to show a few images from Boston, uh, and I want to sort of highlight the, the ambiguities and the tensions that are implicit as, as busing and desegregation move north. Um, there's a very Nixonian quote by Richard Nixon. I love it. He says, some people might oppose busing or re income redistribution for the wrong reasons. He acknowledges, yes, there are racists. But they are by no means the majority of Americans who oppose them for the right reasons. And he doesn't actually spell out who these people are or what those reasons might be. But I want to point out the signs that people are holding in all of these various protest pictures. Most of these are either, uh, in the Boston cases, people living in South Boston who are in the Boston district and are objecting to black students getting bused into their city, or they're suburban districts uh, who don't want students bused out of the city to their, to their town. So in this case, you'll notice that none of the signs say, we will not go to school with Negroes. There's nothing, there's no overt racism going on here. Instead, people are saying things like, 135 school bus accidents last year. Do you want your child to be a statistic? I don't. Well, I mean, who's going to argue with that? Um, America's land of the free. Forced busing. This is not the freedom I want for my kids. The very fact that it becomes called forced busing obviously puts a certain ring on it. Spend money on education, not buses. Again, who's, who's going to argue with that? You're starting to get lots of different sort of attacks on the idea of, of large metropolitan desegregation plans. In this case, whites have rights too. True. Don't invest our money for school buses, invest in improving schools. You'll also notice a woman here is demanding freedom of choice. Um, this is something that begins in the South as basically a way of getting around desegregation orders, but catches on in the North as well. This notion that we should be able to choose where we want to go to school. And if people want, if, if minorities from the inner city want to come to school in the suburbs, they should have the choice to do that provided that they're open seats and provided that they can get transportation and provide a lot of other things. Um, but basically, they don't want any kind of court orders or government action to actually achieve desegregation. All of this reaches ahead in, in the pivotal Mill Milliken v. Bradley case in Detroit, Michigan in 1974. Um, in this case, you have the NAACP of Michigan suing the state of Michigan 
arguing that Detroit, uh, because of white flight to the suburbs, has increasingly segregated schools, and that because of Brown, this is denying black Mich Michiganders, is that what you call someone from Michigan? Black Michiganders <laughs> constitutional rights, and that therefore the state must take steps to remedy the situation. Specifically, they point out that education is a state responsibility. It's written into every state constitution, including Michigan's. And, in case you didn't know this, school districts have no inherent right to exist. School districts are creatures of the state. That is to say, state governments create them because it's convenient to have them administer education. But ultimately, education is a state responsibility, and so states can uncreate them or change them as necessary. And if you need proof of this, the NAACP says, just look at all these big districts in Northern Michigan. Those are all the consolidated rural districts, which the state forcibly consolidated. And over the past 50 years, courts have repeatedly upheld its right to forcibly consolidate these districts. Why shouldn't we do the same for the smaller districts around Detroit? Clearly, if the constitutional right is being violated, the state must take on that responsibility. The state of Michigan, basically representing suburban uh, districts around Detroit, who of course are aghast at the notion that their kids would be sent into the city where there had been race riots only five years before, they have slightly different arguments. They argue, first of all, that the suburban districts in question didn't intentionally segregate, and so surely they should not be held responsible for the segregation that exists. They point out that school districts are the epitome of community-based government, and that this is a long-standing American right and responsibility. A little vague constitutionally where that right is, but it certainly is a long American tradition. And interestingly, they specifically cite the history of rural schoolhouses to back up this claim. Many of them point out that the suburbs where they live had had one-room schools only five or ten years before that. They were only consolidated in the 50s and 60s, and that actually many community members maintained allegiance to their neighborhood school rather even than their suburban district. And so this is sort of their argument for why there should not be forced busing between Detroit and its suburbs. Um, I'll out myself now. Uh, my book is, I would say, communitarian in its approach, which is to say I actually like localism, and I really try to come to its defense again and again throughout the book. I would like to be sympathetic with people who do have the right reasons to oppose busing. That is to say they value localism, they value participation, etc. Legally, I don't think they have led to stand on. I mean, it's just utterly unclear to me what basis they could have for not for the state not to be able to uh, redraw these lines. That being said, when it goes to the Supreme Court, uh, Nixon by this point has appoint, appointed four conservative justices, none of whom are overly fond of desegregation orders. And so Chief Justice Warren Burger comes to a different conclusion and famously writes, boundary lines may be bridged only in circumstances where there has been a constitutional <laughs> violation calling for interdistrict relief. School district lines may not be casually ignored or treated as a mere administrative convenience. Substantial local control of public education in this country is a deeply rooted tradition. Because of that, Milliken v. Bradley basically says, unless you can prove that a suburb has actively segregated, basically unless they have signs on their front yard saying, we are segregating, you cannot force them to be part of any metropolitan busing program or desegregation program. They might voluntarily choose to be, but you certainly cannot compel them. This basically takes what had been somewhat porous district lines, and remember that white inner city students had already been bussed across these lines to perpetuate segregation, and suddenly makes them hard. You cannot cross district lines, which is why if you go to any city right now, uh, when, when I was a college student, for instance, I taught, I student taught in Philadelphia. Um, the school where I student taught, you could see City Line Avenue, which separated Arbor, Pennsylvania, where it was from Philadelphia itself. My sister ended up teaching at Overbrook High School, which was only two miles down the road. City Line was the only thing dividing them, but of course they were profoundly different places. One was a relatively functional suburban school, and Overbrook was just a pit. Badly funded, high truancy rates, crime rates, everything else. Presumably there were kids who actually lived closer to Haverford High School who would have liked to go there, but couldn't because they were still on the wrong side of an imaginary line. And so this potentially is a fundamental problem. And basically, it seems like we have, continuing to this day, an invocation of all the benefits of localism. People still say, oh, I like local control, I like my local school, but it's being pretty cynically applied to perpetuate profound segregation and inequality. And so that's a real dilemma that we need to wrestle with. And again, I want to say clearly, I'm actually for localism. I support localism. But we need to wrestle with this problem of inequality. And so the question is, how then do we do that? Or how do we at least sort of stop it from getting worse, perhaps? Um, 
this is a slide from a colleague of mine who has studied uh, how southern districts, which remember are countywide, uh, have actually in recent years become more like northern districts with the rise of suburbanization in the south. So this is Birmingham, Alabama. It used to be that Birmingham had a city school district and then there was a big county district around it. Both of them had large numbers of African American students and both of them were under desegregation orders and so had achieved a degree of racial balance. Since you've had lots of middle class or upper middle class white families moving out of Birmingham to its suburbs, you've actually seen a sort of fracturing of the Jefferson County School District with new school districts cropping up, usually much wider than the district as a whole and much more affluent than the district as a whole. Just this past week, one of these districts was trying to secede from Jefferson County, and a federal court actually told them that they couldn't, because specifically on listservs and announcements, they had out and out said, we are doing this so we will have fewer black students in our district, which as high a bar as, as Milliken set, they somehow managed to clear it and be very overt about the racism involved. Um, so this is not ancient history. This continues to happen as you see Southern districts fracturing. And to complicate things a little bit, I'll also mention that it's not all racist white suburbanites who are the ones doing this. Another famous case recently in 2007, there was the Picks decision in Seattle, which was joined with a, a desegregation decision in Louisville, Kentucky. Louisville, which is also in Jefferson County, but a different state, um, Louisville had been under court order to desegregate since the 70s. When that court order lifted in the 1990s, they actually voluntarily maintained it and said we would prefer to keep actively desegregating in our district and assigning students to schools on the basis of race because we think that makes it a better district, more equitable district. The Supreme Court actually ruled that they cannot do that, that assigning anyone on the basis of race basically is racism and therefore that this plan would be invalidated. The interesting thing is the plaintiffs in this case, the people challenging the busing plan in Louisville, what the, the group was an African-American community group who, drawing on a long tradition of black power groups and other African-American community groups, basically said, we value our local schools too. We also don't want our kids bust all over creation. We also don't want our community sort of fractured with this big metropolitan plan. And so there's always been some degree of tension on all sorts of sides. In the 1970s, you actually have very unholy alliances between black power groups and explicitly racist groups, both of whom don't like busing. And so why people want to sort of embrace localism or the groups of people that do embrace it might determine to some degree how sort of virtuous you, you, you see their motivations being. That being said, as Nixon said, there are right reasons to oppose large scale top down government programs. And so we would need to think about how, again, we sort of weigh those morally or in their outcomes in achieving a school equity. So lastly, just a few general questions for the discussion. One, to what extent is community a desirable goal in education? Uh, and how should we define community? Two, should we abandon localism either for more centralization, larger metropolitan programs, or potentially for more choice? Maybe we can overcome racism or housing discrimination through vouchers or through charter schools or other kinds of non-geographic school boundaries. I'll point out that much of my book uh, is implicitly critical of 20th century liberals, who I see as not doing a very good job and sort of imposing top-down uh, systems regardless of community. The end of the book is actually quite critical of current conservatives, who used to defend local community for all the wrong reasons, but still were defending it, and now have actually embraced both of these things. Standards, testing, accountability from above, and also vouchers, homeschooling, and charter schools from below. It seems like local school districts actually do not really have a mainstream spokesman at the moment in our, in our policy discourse. Uh, next, can one improve education without first improving housing and employment? Um, you'll notice that basically what we're really talking about here is housing discrimination. And if we were to overcome that and have more mixed income housing, mixed race housing, et cetera, schools would probably take care of themselves, more or less. And so why do we always focus on education first? And is it, can it do any good to focus on education first? Next, is there a way to challenge the legal autonomy of school districts? Is there a way to revisit Milliken, perhaps, or overturn Milliken in the current environment? And lastly, is it possible to reverse the expansion of state and federal bureaucracies in education? Um, I'm up here talking about the value of community and how, you know, how much I like the one-room school, et cetera, but that's a pipe dream. We're obviously not going back to one-room schoolhouses. No one thinks we are. So what good is it, I suppose? I mean, how can we sort of turn back the clock on the top-down regulatory structures, which are now basically being imposed upon our schools? So those are some possible questions. There are many others. Uh, thanks for your time, and I look forward to the discussion. Okay.
All right, thank you so much. And uh, if you have questions, I have the mic. I will, uh, you can raise your hand and I'll just hand it to you. Just want to remind you um, to sign in, the sign-in sheet and the books are for sale on the back. But anyone, questions? Yes. I have more of a statement um, regarding the previous slide. I just wanted to say that's not really even um, limited to the South. Where I'm from in New Jersey, I'm right outside New York City, and I come from a predominantly white town sandwiched between a predominantly minority town and another predominantly white town. Um, we have gone to the predominantly minority high school since, basically since our town was created, and this year, well within the past month, my school, well the district of my town has been trying to um, separate itself from the minority school and they use reasons like it's for the budget, um, their tuition's too expensive, but we all know that the underlying reasons are for racist reasons. So I just want to bring to attention that's not just the South and it's a problem everywhere, I'm sure. Although again, I'll, I'll repeat, it's hard to know whether someone does have sort of implicitly racist reasons or not, any individual, although I think in, in aggregate no one would dispute that they are. But that's what makes it so tough, is what if someone can put up a defensible reason that is legitimately good? Again, there's a real dilemma here. How We're not very well equipped to sort of suss out what people's real reasons are, and certainly not to, to actually use that to force change, fortunately. Hi, um, I had a kind of comment, but also question in the end. Uh, when I talk to people, like older people, about um, kind of this time period of desegregation, especially in like the, our the local county, like Prince George's County, and like Washington D.C., usually it's from the point of view, or it's like a common agreement that like when it, the desegregation occurred, uh, the major problem was it wasn't it was a one-sided desegregation. Like it was like black kids going to like uh, white schools. It wasn't more like white kids could stay in their own schools. So it was the comfortability of that. Do you think that would like, like, because like it's still an issue today. Do you think that could be like an option of like, like how would that go over today if someone's like, okay, guys, like we're gonna shift you guys around. Well, not necessarily busting because we have schools enough schools for you to stay in your community, but it's just it's not your the one you're used to. You went through K through twelve. So uh, have you like heard discussion about that? Yeah, I have a few things to say. Yes. Um, one of the flaws of the Brown decision is that it, it, a lot of it turns on notions of, of sort of black pathology or black students feeling like they're not as good as white students, et cetera. And that's the, the whole famous Kenneth Clark Dolls study is what sort of establishes that. Because of that, there's no question after Brown which schools are going to be closed and which kids are going to be moved. It's always, as you're saying, black students going to white schools because they're the better ones, ostensibly. Um, even today, when again, that's not really the discussion we're having, if you go to any city and look at school closures, I have colleagues in Philadelphia, I have colleagues in Charleston, South Carolina, whenever schools are closed, predictably, it's always poor black schools that are closed. It's never the historic more white schools that are. And so even now, there is a certain burden that some sub-communities bear when it comes to school closures and sort of moving students around. I'll also point out that one of the reasons that a lot of black power groups object to desegregation in the 1960s and 70s is if you go to like a large countywide district where you're gonna bus students around, achieving racial balance almost by definition means that black students are going to be a minority at any school that they go to. And black parents will be a minority as a voice in the PTA or the school board. Basically you're diluting black political power. You're making sure that black students, rather than just being students with kids that are like them, where they might have role models and sort of mutual respect, we're going to go to hostile environments, and you know, microaggressions is kind of the language of today. But back then, they knew the same thing: that these students were going to have a much harder time of it. Uh, it's unclear exactly what the benefits for them are going to be. They might have been doing fine already in their segregated schools. So desegregation has always been a very contentious issue, even within the black community, for a lot of the reasons that you're outlining, and potentially should remain so today. I mean, obviously, I could come up with lots of arguments why we should still be very committed to, to full desegregation. But I understand people who might not be, who might think other goods for their own children are more important than some abstract ideal of desegregation. So first, thank you, Cam. That was a great presentation. And uh, we really appreciate your good work on this uh, 
perplexing issue because I think there are tensions, as there so often are in public policy, against competing goods. Um, but rather speak, I'm going to take off my policy hat and come back to this question because I think it's a really good one. Um, on a personal note, uh, I lived in Charlotte-Mecklenburg County. Uh, I was four when that decision was rendered. And I was five and in kindergarten when the busing started. So, so you can do the math and figure out how. <laughs> so uh, that, that's not really the point. But as a, as a kid, and I honestly didn't, you know, as a child, I knew nothing of this. In fact, it wasn't until I was in my doctoral program at Cornell and I was taking a school law class. <laughs> and I saw the dates and I was kind of putting it together and I realized, you know, that, that it all made a lot more sense than it had made when I was five in those schools. But I, I, your comment resonates greatly with me because there were no white kids bused uh, out of my district. It was just poor African American kids being bused in. And you know, while I was in a middle middle class, it wasn't an upper middle class, but you know, a, a standard middle class neighborhood, um, the kids that were bused in didn't have, you know, didn't have shoes that matched. They, you know, they. Their clothing wasn't the same as the clothing of the kids in these schools. They were all on free meals, and you know the the lunchroom was very different and segregated. And I think some of the points that Cam raises and and that that, uh, that you raised as well are extremely salient. I think while the intention was to promote greater equity, um, the school was full of teachers who didn't know how to deal with this. They were um, the the inequities that five, six, seven, eight-year-olds were visibly seeing every day when something went missing, for instance, the whole notion of due process was right out the window. So the kinds of lessons that I think a lot of these kids were learning about different racial groups um, working together couldn't be learned in that environment without things like better professional development and a recognition of the depth of the discrimination that had long lived in, in those communities. Um, you know, the parents were never at school events. It was all white families that, that came to the school events because the school was in a white neighborhood. It would be hard for those folks to get there. So I think that, you know, the efforts that we've seen to desegregate through busing and, and other efforts, you know, just fell far short in large part because they weren't complemented with the kinds of resources and investments and training and sensitivity that would need to come with those kinds of policies if they have any hope at all of being successful. So. If I could make a counterpoint uh, yeah. and complicate Charlotte even further, uh, when Ronald Reagan is running for president in 1980 as a conservative, and he, he's a very outspoken about educational issues, he's for school prayer, he's against the Department of Education, he's firmly against busing. And this is like a dog whistle for all of his conservative suburban voters who are against busing. He shows up in Charlotte and he gives his stump speech. And usually when he says, busing is this social experiment that no one wants, it's being forced down our throat, this is the big applause line. In Charlotte, he gives this speech, and crickets chirk. No one claps. And the next day, the Charlotte newspaper basically says, you were wrong. Charlotte has accepted busing. We're all fine with it. Uh, and in some degree, this shows the, the potential of metropolitan acceptance, especially because over the subsequent 20 years, uh, the achievement gap in North Carolina narrows. Uh, black students do better in multiple measures on, in educational performance, and it does not come at the cost of white student achievement. And so everything seems to actually be working to plan, except, as I mentioned, now in North Carolina, school boards are suddenly doing away with busing programs, fracturing their districts, and so it didn't persist. Uh, I'm not exactly sure why that is, but I'll mention that the reason that initially it did work was because it was a shared cost. That is to say, it wasn't like Boston, where just poor working class South Boston was gonna have to do the integrating. Everyone was gonna integrate. And so there was no disproportionate effect on anybody. But as soon as there is a disproportionate effect and you feel like your student is going to somehow suffer because of integration, that's when it becomes this, this zero-sum game. Yeah, and lest I sound like a naysayer on this policy, because I, I, I know I, I shined a light on the, the negative sides that were mostly associated with adults. It was very different from the perspective of kids. I think these kids, I, I remember my, my own experience wanting to get to know these other kids. I remember kids, I remember their names. Um, Donna wanted to be a teacher. Those kids had the same aspirations as the kids in my community. So I think the kids were in a good place with this. For the most part, open-minded and ready to get to know each other and play together, and in fact, we did play together. Um, it, was, it was a problem at the adult level and the way the policy was structured and the lack of training so that it, you know, I don't know because I was a white kid at the time, but I'm sure that it felt like or could have felt like a hostile environment for, for many of those kids with their interactions with the teachers and the adults. Um, but at the kid level, I think there was a real openness. So we need to remember that too, that kids are impressionable and this may be the way to turn things around.
you would one, one the first. Okay. Oh. Um, <clears throat> so I wanted to ask about three things, and one of them is unrelated to this particular lecture, just in terms of your con your research in other contexts. Uh, I was wondering if you could explain the concept of the metro fringe. Um, and then secondly, um, you had talked about suburban opposition to a range of things developing over time, busing, teachers unions, equalized funding. But I was wondering if you could explain what you meant by suburban opposition to objectionable curriculum. And then the last thing I wanted to ask about if you had knowledge of it and a, a detailed thoughts on it was the current sort of very sort of publicly interesting HBCU lawsuit um, that's going on on the state level um, in Maryland. I don't know if you know about that and you had thoughts on it. I'm going to say very little about HBCUs only because it's not my area of expertise. I will say that there too, I mean, it, it's sort of uh, in the higher education version of a lot of the stuff we're talking about here, right? Where on the one hand, surely we all advocate for integration somehow conceived in higher education. HBCUs are a vestige of a segregated system. Well, obviously, when African American students couldn't get higher education or professional training, they had to go there. But even now, of course, HBCUs themselves and many of their alumni think they serve a vital purpose for a number of reasons, sort of a non-hostile environment for black students, the idea of developing one, oneself in, in sort of a, a, a self-determined environment, again, where you can just be yourself and not be a token black student, what have you. Um, they don't sit easily with the notion of pursuing integration doggedly, because obviously we wouldn't want HBCUs if they did. But a lot of the talk now around it sort of moves in two directions. On the one hand, we're actually more okay now, even in K-12, with not one unitary system, but many different kinds of schools, charter schools that are Spanish language or science inquiry or whatever it might be. And so obviously HBCUs can serve a purpose that I think more Americans are sort of more comfortable with, that not everyone has to go to the same kind of institution. On the other hand, this question of whether or not uh, they will be, they'll be able to get the same funding, for instance, there is still obviously a certain hierarchy and a certain structural inequality that they need to deal with. So I'm not going to go into details, but I'll just say it's a tough, it's a tough situation because it's a tough uh, to know where our values should lie with HBCUs. Um, you sort of asked about the rest of the book, and I'll just mention what I presented today is not even a quarter of the argument. Uh, this was it's Black History Month, and this was the most sort of uh, topical of, of, of some of the debates. The book also talks about teachers' unions, it also talks about school funding, and it also talks about curriculum. In all of these areas, I argue basically that suburbanites moving into what had been rural areas and initially clash with rural populations. They don't actually want one-room schools. They want their kids going to college. But they do like the notion that one-room schools and community buy-in might give them some kind of autonomy. And so in case after case, when you have teachers saying, we have certain professional rights, you can't just fire us because you want to, suburbanites say, no, we can and there are huge strikes. In fact, the longest teacher strike in American history is in sort of an ex-urban community in New Hampshire, of all places. Um, this picture is from Hortonville, Wisconsin, and if you talk to anyone from Wisconsin and just say Hortonville, it still sort of uh, jogs people's memory. In 1974, a town basically shut down. People were hitting each other with their cars. The National Guard was called out. It was a big deal because the local teachers wanted to unionize, and the town did not want them to unionize. And so questions of whether you should have professional rights or local democratic rights are sort of front and center. Um, school funding traces a lot of the same equity issues where you have poor districts and rich districts, but you have affluent suburban places, again, saying, we have local control. You can't take our money and redistribute it. And lastly, with, with curriculum, again, this sort of notion of professional rights and whether a teacher should have a right to assign a book, even though parents might object to that book being assigned. How do you arbitrate between parents' democratic rights, majority rights, versus either the professional rights of teachers or the individual rights of students to read what they want, say, in a school library. Um, and again, I'll be very honest here. Uh, the curriculum chapter, it's not that I come out in defense of censorship. I'm not for censorship, but I understand. I mean, it's not that the people who are trying to ban books are bigots, necessarily. They're really trying to say, we want parents' rights. And when you put it that way, why shouldn't they have parents' rights? Isn't that the more democratic uh, response than empowering unelected teachers or unelected superintendents to make curriculum decisions. Um, so there again, we have some thorny dilemmas to, to tackle when it comes to who chooses what kids are actually learning and how much right they have to forbid kids from learning something.
All right, so I had a question if you want to flip back to the slide you had with your suggestion questions. Um, I don't want to throw one of your questions back to you, but the idea of the, of the last question, I think one of the things I think about when we talk about the recent expansion of federal role in education comes really to the term of dollars and cents. And I think the question I guess I have is, how do you see local schools and communities gaining back control of their local schools if a lot of the money and the funding that they receive from federal and state you know, education departments come with strings attached? How, do, how are schools gonna be able to kind of play with that dichotomy and make their own decisions of becoming a local school versus a school that receives these money, the money from these institutions? Um, you'll notice that very few schools can do without external subsidies, right? They're not gonna turn down money. And they're usually willing to accept the strings that come with it. However, you should also remember that the federal government, for all of its increasingly coercive reforms since No Child Left Behind, it's sort of a bluff. That is to say, they expect that the schools will take the money and will accept the strings. Uh, recently, with the Common Core debates, many districts have basically said, no, we are not going to either not going to administer these tests or large numbers of parents withhold their students on testing day and don't take the tests. In which case, the government doesn't have the data it needs to actually afford, uh, 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 appropriate the money or not. Um, there are ways that local districts can sort of push back. I'll also point out that as coercive as the federal government has gotten with many of its reforms, in most districts, federal funding still does not account for more than 10% of the district budget. So the government's trying to sort of exercise outsized power for its actual contributions. Depending on which state you live in, uh, local revenues still comprise up to 60% of the school budget, and the rest is, you know, 30 to 50% is usually state revenues. So there too, uh, I'm not sure that state uh, empowerment is exactly local control, but maybe it's moving in that direction. With the SSA passed recently, sort of loosening some of these screws that have been attached to testing with No Child Left Behind, it's possible that we'll see a rising state role and maybe even a rising local role insofar as all of these reforms have to be implemented at the local level anyway. Uh, local actors and local uh, interest groups can actually have quite a bit of influence, potentially. Uh, thanks for your talk. I'm wondering if instead of seeing the decline of community, we're seeing the disentanglement of community uh, from geography. Uh, so, for instance, I wonder if there's communitarianism to certain arguments for, say, charter schools and vouchers that take a pluralist form. And uh, just to give some examples of those, it would be that charter schools, even though, of course, they're uh, sometimes very far from particular neighborhoods, there are ways for, say, Catholic schools with their specific sources of social capital to stay open. There might be a celebration of the possibility of charter schools to, for instance, teach Hebrew or have halal food in cafeterias. And also there's the argument of arguments of uh, someone say like Michael McConnell that charter schools or vouchers take some of the pressure off of regular public schools in trying to give a coherent moral structure uh, to democracy while not becoming comprehensive institutions. Um, Checkerfin and others also have argued that charter schools are actually more communitarian than, than traditional public schools have become, right? And so there is this argument that by choosing your community, Spanish language or Hebrew or whatever it might be, that's real communitarianism. Early in the lecture, I, I mentioned uh, Alexei de Tocqueville and this notion of sort of, I, I said, I think, local slash private initiative. And this might be a very fine distinction. Uh, I am a little skeptical about the role of private initiative for reasons of oversight and also reasons of sort of self-segregation. This might go back to the HBCU idea. Um, I do think the community needs to be pluralistic in a more substantive sense. Not that it needs to be firmly geographic, but we do need to interact with people that are not like us. I think that's important. Um, and so I prefer local public community, and I'm more hesitant about private interest groups, although I recognize that both communitarians can come in both varieties. Um, but yeah, given the fact that charter schools are so poorly regulated at the moment, uh, I would prefer some degree of local buy-in that is geographically sort of bounded. Any other questions? Okay, all right. Thank you all for coming. I'd like to thank our author for a wonderful talk. And there's still snacks in the back of the books back here.